So what do you think it would have been like if Moses gets to the edge of the Red Sea, puts his staff in the water, and nothing happens? End of the story. Massacre, right? Bad ending to that story. What do you think it would have been like if Daniel gets thrown into the lion's den, prays, and God doesn't answer? End of the story, right? Bad ending. Bad ending. What would it have been like for Saul? What would it have been like for David, for Solomon, kings, to go into battle saying, God sent us, and then God just didn't show up? What would it have been like for Ezekiel? What would it have been like for all these people? All those people have one thing in common. When Jesus and the New Testament, his disciples, talk about them, they say that those people had the Spirit of God rush upon them. They were anointed with the Spirit of God, God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And because of that connection, all those things happened. Samson, right? Classic story. It says the Spirit of God rushed upon him and then he went out and fought his battles. The Spirit of God rushed upon him and then he went and killed the Philistines. Rushed, that rushing feeling of like the power of God enabling you to do something that's beyond you happened in every single one of those stories. It's why they happened. The Red Sea didn't part just because Moses believed in a God. It's because at that moment in time, God needed a Red Sea to part so his people could go out. And so he told the right person at the right time, listen to me, this is what I'm about to do, what God's about to do. And if you put yourself in the right position, I will use you. If Moses didn't step up, God's not going to be thwarted. If Daniel doesn't step up, if Samson, he's going to work his way. But he calls us for a graduate. He calls you to something. And the most interesting thing, in all those moments, you don't see those people praying, Holy Spirit, give me power right now. They were with God, and so they had connection to God's power all the time. And so at the right moment, the amazing things could happen. It's interesting. We think about, Holy Spirit, give me the power to be able to do something. Or just, God, give me your spirit. And then whenever you're about to do something, I know it's going to work. I know it's going to happen. This connection with God is not meant to be just a case-by-case -case basis. It's meant to be a permanent connection. And if you look at kind of the history of the Holy Spirit in the whole Bible, I find this really interesting. The very first couple of verses of the Bible says the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. And then you have God making men, and he makes them like a shell, makes people. But in that vessel, that empty shell, he puts a spirit. His Spirit. Right, the Spirit is, is part of creation. The Holy Spirit is involved in making everything. The Holy Spirit is part of making people. The Holy Spirit is part of every great moment of every biblical character that was recorded. The Holy Spirit is part of every great moment of ours. And the Holy Spirit showed up along the way as people were doing what God called them to do. Moses didn't like set aside a spiritual retreat and say, that's when I'm going to get close to God or that's when the miracles are going to happen. He was just ready. The Holy Spirit stepped in as people were living out God's plan. It wasn't just learning about the Holy Spirit. It was actually connecting with God and with His Spirit. So I, Paul writes in one of his letters, Church, I don't want you to be unaware. I don't want you to be ignorant about how spiritual things work. And that's how I feel about us this morning. I'm going to read from John. Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit that He's about to give. But it's not a new spirit. It's just given in a new way. And if we can look at how God has given His Spirit, what the Holy Spirit has done throughout all of history, from the very beginning all the way to the last days, say, well, where do we fit into that? And I say, well, what part of God's journey are you walking? And are you connected? Because those are the two most important things. Moses could not part a Red Sea sitting back with his flocks of sheep. He also couldn't part the Red Sea at the Red Sea without the Holy Spirit. So it's a combination of God doing what he's going to do with people who are ready, people who are prepared, and people who are connected. And we want to be ready. So this is now, right? Let's get ready. Let's get our minds thinking. Stay connected. And then you don't have to worry that at a certain moment, if you pray, you have need to like pray the right prayer or do the right thing. You're just being with God. And he's about to do things. 
and He will use you. And that's a Holy Spirit moment. We need more of them. We need those beautiful moments. But I want to read in Jesus' own words for all of us from the Gospel of John uh, what He says about it. So it's a little bit in chapter 14, a little bit in 15, and a little bit in 16. This is where Jesus is kind of giving His closing teaching to His disciples saying his final words. We're kind of bouncing around now for the last couple of weeks in the Gospel of John to catch all these things. So, you know, last week we were in chapter 17, but now we're back to 14, 15, and 16 to focus on the Holy Spirit. So, while I'm reading what Jesus said, I want you to not just think of it in terms of him in that moment. He's saying what the Holy Spirit will be for his disciples, but think of it also before How was God's Spirit active in that same way before this moment in time they're about to read? And then think about it today. How also is God's Spirit looking to move in us today? If it stays as just words on a page, we're missing the most important part. We're supposed to be spirit people. We're created and designed to live by spirit in these bodies. We can't miss this. And Jesus, the authority on the subject, gives us some great thoughts to... To consider. So, John chapter 14, um, I'll start with verse 15. John 14, 15. Jesus says, If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Another helper. Not the helper with a capital T, although that's a great title for the Holy Spirit. Another helper. The word helper there, some Bibles call the advocate, another advocate, or the counselor, or the comforter. And those are all great ways to describe that term. But it's not actually an easy term to put into English. Uh, It's uh, parakletos. And that was someone who in the Greek times, in the Roman times, would be called in as like a witness for the defense. Someone would come to court, here's my parakletos, a helper, someone to speak on my behalf, someone who has my back, who can speak to my character, but also add aid in my time of need. You know, you're before the judge, it's a moment, it's a trial, and there's someone who comes alongside. Parakletos, para means along with, and kaleo is someone who's called. So it's like someone who can call alongside you at just the moment you need it. You know, the person that you know if it's 2 a.m. and you're broken down, that's the one you can call. That's your parakletos. Paraclete, we call it sometimes. And there isn't a better definition for it in English because it's kind of a comforter, but it's not just like an emotional thing, but absolutely can be for our emotions. Holy Spirit, come alongside my emotions right now because I'm depressed and I'm discouraged and I'm lonely. Well, that's perfect, (laughs) but it's not limiting in that way. It's not just that. It's also, right now I need to know what to say in this situation. Give me words. And the Holy Spirit comes alongside. Spiritual gifts, spiritual fruit, miracles, all these things, those are God coming alongside us, the paraclete. But it's another because Jesus knows that he's the first. Another helper. So Jesus has been the paracletos for his disciples. He's been right alongside them, God with them, walking, providing miracles, multiplying loaves and fishes whenever they needed it, teaching them when they called out, Lord, help me, because they're sinking in the water or the storms, but he's right there. So the same way the Holy Spirit is our helper, Jesus is the same. And we're going to see, actually, in 1 John, maybe we'll flip there, maybe we won't, so I'll tell you, I'll give you a preview. The only other time that word is used in the Bible is in 1 John, talking about Jesus, as we have another advocate who intercedes on our behalf. So Jesus is our helper. But the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, is also is another helper, and Jesus is promising this help for all of his people. So again, God promises someone to come alongside Moses when he needs it, Daniel when he needs it, all these people when he needs it, Samson when he needs it, the disciples when they need it, us when we need it, our children when we need it, in college when they need it, in life. Like, this is the promise of God's help, his support. We are not on our own. And that's why Jesus starts saying all these things about, I do not leave you alone as orphans, because that one who is called alongside is God himself. And we can call him alongside us to carry us. So again, 15. If you love me, Jesus says, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another parakletos to be with you forever even the spirit of truth. Okay, so this is not a physical person. This is going to be a spirit and a true spirit, but one whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. 
You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So this is clearly not a person in a physical form. This is a spirit. It's a truthful spirit from God dwelling inside of us. And Jesus says, because of this, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet in a little while, the world will see me no more, but you will see me. And because I live, you also will live. And in that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Kind of this like triangle, right? <laughs> I'm in the Father, I'm in you, and you're in me. Verse 21, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father and I will love him, and I will manifest myself to him. Pay attention to that word manifest. It's like the doing. It's not just the thinking of this. It's the doing, the happenings, the, the amazing things that happen along the way. Those are manifestations. Jesus says, um, I will love him and manifest myself to him. Now Judas, not Judas Iscariot, this is another Judas, one of Jesus' followers, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us, but not to the world? And Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Right? I will abide in you, you will abide in me, that sort of thing. He's about to say all of that in chapter 15, but he hints at it. Right? He will make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. Then the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. So the Father is sending his word. Now these things, Jesus, that I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper the parakletos, the Holy Spirit. So there's the very plain definition. This is the Holy Spirit that Jesus is talking about. Whom the Father will send in my name. So in Jesus' name, we receive the Holy Spirit. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. My peace I leave with you. So the Spirit will bring peace. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. So let not your hearts be troubled, and neither let them be afraid. So jump over to the end of John chapter 15. He, this is a long conversation from Jesus. We want to focus on the parts where he's describing the Holy Spirit. All right. Um, let's go with verse 23 and pick up from there. Chapter 15, verse 23. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen, and they've hated both me and my Father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. But when the Helper comes, that one called alongside, when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, Jesus is handing off the Spirit, comes from Jesus, from the Father, when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will also bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. Flip a little bit further along. Verse 5 of chapter 16. I even right in the middle of four there, leads into it. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer, and concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things, almost parenthetically, but many things I wish I could or wish I had time to say to you. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, and therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So Jesus says all these things, then he prays over his disciples and then he's betrayed, he's arrested, he's crucified, he rises again, he appears back to his disciples, 
and they believe all these things that he said. And then he leaves them again. He ascends. And then they're left thinking, well, what next? But he tells them, wait here. And then the Holy Spirit will be poured out. The, the words uh, pouring are, are so often found in relationship to the Holy Spirit. Pouring is a great way to think of it. Uh, and filling. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Every Christian should be a Spirit-filled Christian. And I kind of feel like it's a shame that that phrase has sort of like been identified with certain denominations or certain types of faith because the Bible says we're supposed to be filled with the Spirit. So that's, that's truth and that's Bible. But sometimes Spirit becomes like um, a metaphor for however I feel. And so then my spirit's leading me, but you don't know, is that really that person's spirit or is that the Holy Spirit? And then we have lots of things happening. We're not really sure what's from God and what's not. But if we're not careful, we're going to throw the baby out with the bathwater and have no spirit. If you have no spirit, then you have no miracles. If you have no spirit, then you have no wisdom. If you have no spirit, then you have no power over things like addiction. If you have no sp and sadly, that kind of more defines the church of our day and age. It's a place without any of the power. And so I think our fear of excesses, our fear of not knowing what from God and what's not has led us to like play it too safe and not give in to the Holy Spirit. We need to be filled with this Spirit. And everything that Jesus says about the Spirit is amazing. And every person we see in the Old Testament all through the New one, the Holy Spirit like rushes upon them. Like, look out world, look out armies, look out death, look out anything, because it's just God's power at work. So we should want this. That's why we have entire chapters in Corinthians about this is what it's like to be spirit people, spiritual. You should have stuff like coming out of you. You should talk and, and somehow like you're speaking different languages and you should say something to someone and to you it's just a thought. And when they hear it, it's like the actual words of God, knowledge and wisdom that you didn't prepare. It's not a sermon. It's just talking. But because you're plugged into God, it, it comes out the right way at the right time. If we don't have that, then we're the blind leading the blind. And that's, I don't want that for us. I don't want to be a great church of people that know about God. I want to hear and I want to see us experiencing God. And that experience now will happen through the Holy Spirit or it ain't going to happen at all. Because this is the time where God has given us the Spirit. So it's Spirit or nothing. It's Spirit or That's what God has chosen. Now if we were with Moses, we would have had the Spirit on one man. Like, like the, one of those shafts of light coming out of heaven and just like radiating on one single person, like think in the theater or something, right? Like one person is lit up and everybody around them is still stumbling around in the dark. That's how God gave the Holy Spirit leading up to Christ and Pentecost. It was for a moment, it was for a miracle, and it was for a person. There's this great story uh, in, um, in Moses' life where God says, I'm going to take some of the Spirit that's on you, now we're going to spread it around a little bit. So pick 70 more people, and I'm going to take of that spirit, and we're going to share it. And so he says, okay, and he calls these 70 elders of Israel around, and God takes the spirit. All of a sudden, they start prophesying and speaking from God and being filled with the spirit, and they're just alive in a way that they weren't. The moment before, they were following Moses and saw that there was something living in him, and the next moment, they were experiencing that themselves. And so everybody's excited. This is like, this is a happening. And then Moses gets word that there's these other people on the other side of camp, and they're prophesying too, but they weren't chosen. Moses didn't pick them as part of the 70. And so people are getting mad. Like, no, 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 you weren't picked to be spirit-filled. And he says, I wish that everyone had God's spirit and would prophesy. That's right. And that's, that's why that's up on the wall. It was actually Moses' dream. One of the first people that we get to see what that spirit is like sitting on him. And think of Moses' life. That's all because of God's spirit enabling. He's just a guy and a messed up guy who messed up a lot. But with God's spirit, because he was willing to walk, he's like, I'm going to walk this way. I don't know how. And the spirit rushed into him at just the right moments. When he couldn't have predicted what would happen, the right thing happened because it's God's moment. But God called him and he listened. And then he sent the helper. He sent the one who would come alongside, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of truth, Ten Commandments, laws, the words of God, but also the activity, the power of God, healing, water from, you know, this Moses, that guy, was just like us. But he was willing to let God, so now it's happening on a broader scope, and Moses just kind of almost like muses to himself, imagine if everybody was like that. And then a prophet, Joel, comes along 
after Israel's lived and risen and fall, and he says, there is going to come a day, God says, when I'll pour out my spirit on all people. And you're young and you're old. They're going to prophesy and they're going to see visions and they're going to come alive. It's going to happen. But everybody still sees God's spirit like the spotlight from heaven. Uh, who's the king? There's the king. Who's the priest? There's the priest. Who's the rabbi? There's the rabbi. They're the ones that are too holy. They're the ones that can go talk to God. And that's the reason. To break that paradigm is the reason that Christ came in human form. So that there wouldn't just be a spotlight approach to faith anymore. It would be just like blast the doors open, pouring light out kind of experience with the Spirit. But we're the kind of people that revert. We always forget what we've learned need to be reminded. And so in every era of the church, we put pastors and priests back into their spotlight. We're like, oh, if I could just be a missionary overseas in Africa, then I could follow God's will for my life. And meanwhile, we're surrounded by hundreds of people that we know and love who are not being a missionary too. And somehow we think if we lived in a different country, we'd be a better spokesperson for God. Well, you could have the Holy Spirit here light you up so that you light others up, or it could happen in Zimbabwe. But it doesn't matter where you are. You're just following God and you're connected. And because you're connected, then the light comes out when it's supposed to come out. And you don't have to be special. You're not supposed to be special. And if we lose this, then we lose our testimony. If we lose spirit, we lose our effectiveness as the church. And if we lose this kind of alive thing that we have with God, then we're just bookworms for a really old book. And we know lots of information about a history book. And people are not interested in learning about our history book. They're not interested in that. But they would be interested in knowing how to overcome an addiction. And that's a Holy Spirit kind of thing. That's freedom. Flesh versus spirit, right? They really would be interested in knowing how to overcome the depression that has them locked at home, that they don't even want to go out anymore. But things like hope are from the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit's the answer to that question too. But if we come to them and just say, oh, well, I read a book, an interesting book about some facts, and I can tell them to you, that's not the same thing as them looking at us and being like, that's someone that actually has hope. I'm going to ask them where it comes from. And then for us not to say, well, I'll get my pastor. He can answer that for you. <laughs> or there's a great course coming up three Wednesdays from now, 7 p.m. If you go there, they'll teach you what you need to know. No, it's just like we're with God and he's good. And we don't really even know how it works because it's a mystery. And that's cool. Don't know how it works. Someone says to you, how does this faith thing? Work? But he shows up. Amen. And if he shows up, then it's real. And if we pray and it gets answered, then that's our faith. That's the foundation. And all Holy Spirit conversation. This is not just knowledge stuff. You know, this is where, why we love. We don't know why we love. And we try to love people, and the people are trying really hard to love never really works. We're like fighting for it. But then sometimes we just have love for someone, and they don't deserve it. That's Holy Spirit stuff. We need to be people of the Spirit. Not like the church in Galatia where he said, why are you so foolish? You began with the Spirit, but now you're trying to do a good job. You began with God's grace, but now you're trying to work really hard at it. You began by just believing, but now you're trying to like effort this Christian walk. It's not like that. College students, as you go away, like don't try to be the best you. Like stay connected to God. And then in a moment when you need to rise to the occasion, you just will. And you're like, I don't really even know how that worked. But you'll be connected. That's our job, is to be filled and to be connected. God will take care of the rest. You don't need to know what's coming. You don't need to know what the challenge is. It isn't like, well, if I just knew in advance that this was going to happen to me at that moment, I could have prepared myself better. And I would have thought about what it would have said in advance, so I could have handled that temptation a little bit more wisely. We can't. We don't know when stuff is going to hit us. But God does, and he's ready to part the sea. If we stay connected to him, the miracles will happen and it'll feel like we're not even really sure how. And it's not going to be because of us. It's going to be because of God because it's his story. And we're just the people moving along it, trying to connect with him. So let's use a metaphor. Maybe it's a silly one. I don't know. For me, it kept coming back to mind. Maybe it'll help. In Jesus' time, he always used metaphors that were suited to that day and age. A lot of agriculture, Right? A lot of lords and servants, those things because that's what world the people were in that were listening. Well, we're in an electrical and technological age, and I actually think that that's a beautiful metaphor for the power of God. And so if I were to use like electricity and power, our modern understanding of it, we say that God is like the ultimate 
power center. He's like a nuclear reactor, unlimited, all powerful, anytime for anyone. But no one has that power but him. There's only one. There's only one power source. That's it. So if you look at the Old Testament, you see that God kind of plugged in one individual at a time. A little extension cord from God to each person. So that person was powered, and this person was powered, and they had the power. But everyone else was kind of like following. Where is God leading this leader instead of where is God speaking to each of us? Think about it in Jesus' form. It's like the, the power of God came and was present here on earth. You know, a portable generator. Will that do? For those of us who go camping, you take the power and you bring it with us for a time. And it works and it powers everything else you need. But the disciples were still just all plugged into Jesus. They weren't yet operating on that level where they're plugged straight into God. They had not yet received the Holy Spirit. And this is interesting. They did miracles while Jesus was with them, before he left, before he gave them the Holy Spirit. So they were doing miracles by the power of God, but it was this like one-off thing. So the disciples then, the way I was picturing this, they're like one of those portable chargers for your cell phone. <laughs> they plugged into the genera generator and they, they powered up, but they had enough for like a day. They had like one miracle's worth of power, and then they'd run back and be like, that was exhausting, Jesus, how do you do this? And he's like, I am powered by the universe, the universal God who has all and knows all and is all. This is no problem. You have little faith with your tiny little rechargeable battery. But when the Spirit got poured out, it's just like from heaven, like millions of power cords all coming down and plugging into each and every one. Everybody powered. And Christ is the one that's handing that off. He's the one sending down the connections. We're connected straight to God. We're not temporary in the way that the disciples needed to be because they didn't yet have that connection with God. We're not individual in the way the Old Testament used to be. We're, we're corporate, together. We're, we're binding together. And it's like when you put one candle with one candle with one candle, you end up with really a lot of light. But it's not because you're supposed to be plugged into me. Like, God bless you if you're trying to live vicariously off of your pastor, no matter what church you go to. That's not how it works. Nope. It, it can't work that way. You're going to find yourself lacking energy and lacking power because you're trying to draw from something that's not the source of power. But you're looking at someone else. Think of your, your favorite Christian, your most respected mother, parent, aunt, uncle, Christian leader, that person. You can't be a Christian through them. It doesn't work. And you find yourself being like, why, why can't I pray like them? Why can't I have faith like that? Your faith is in something that's not the source. And while that might have been the way for some time of God's like unveiling of his sovereign plan, it's not the way it's supposed to be now. So if you're trying to live vicariously off of others, you'll run out of steam. You're just going to fail. The lights are going to go out. But if you stay connected, and the connection is such a simple thing too. A connection can just be a moment where you quiet yourself. And you're like, God, I love you so much. That's plugging in. Now that's a prayer, but it doesn't need to be a prayer. You don't have to call it a prayer. It's just the being together. Jesus says, my father and I, we're going to make our home with you. Like we're a household. We're family. We're together no matter where you go. So anywhere we send our students and our graduates off to, it's fine. Go anywhere. The further you are from your family is not the further you are from God. The further you are from your home church is not the further that you are from God. But if you get further from family and home church and you start to feel a little bit more discouraged, you start to feel a little bit weaker, it may be that you were plugged into your family. You might have been plugged into your church. And that's like even okay. We, like get, we realize that sometimes. Like, oh, I don't know how much of this was mine, but it's got to be mine. And then when you find yourself lacking, you plug directly into God, you find that you're more charged than you ever were because it's personal and it's for you and He loves you. So this, what we're reading today, is, is everything. It's everything. It's everything. It's God's plan for this era of his church. It's God's promise that this is how we're going to make it to the end times. This is like opportunity to actually have experiences with God that no one before Christ had the same advantage and access that we do. So don't take it for granted and don't waste it. 
if we find along the way that we're plugged into the wrong things and they're not actually working, okay, it's fine. <laughs> you realized. We could pray for that to happen sooner. What's, there's a term in business these days, fail fast. Fail fast. Realize quicker that no one else is going to actually bring comfort except for God. And then you can stop trying to expect your relationships to fix it. Because they can't. Or they can temporarily, like a one day's worth of a charge. <laughs> Instead of like, I'm an okay, always, sort of. I have ups and downs, like, we're okay, sort of thing. Right? Fail fast in expecting your jobs that you're going into to be this thing that makes you supremely happy and confident in yourself and like successful. Because you're going to run dry on that eventually. Okay, good. Recognize that sooner than later so you can plug into something that no matter what job you have, you're going to love it. And you're going to love the people you're around. And you're going to love yourself in it. And you're going to love where it takes you because it's not about the job. It's about you being connected to God in whatever job you're in. So fine, fail fast. Fail fast in money. If I just had a little bit more, then I wouldn't be so stressed. And then you find you have more money and more stress. More money more problems, right? Heard that somewhere before. I don't think it's in the Bible, but I heard that somewhere before. <laughs> so fail fast to know that God is the one who is on our side. And when you call out, dear money, save me. Dear boyfriend, girlfriend, save me. Dear boss, save me. And nothing happens. That would have been what it would have been like for Moses to be on the, the shore and be like, God save us. And his hope was in the wrong thing. Then you just die. You're done. You, lights go out. But it didn't for him. And it didn't for Daniel. Lights didn't go out. God stepped in and he showed up because he is actually the source of what we need. And so if we put our trust in the right place, we'll stay plugged in. So do the little things every day. Tell God you love him. Spend time with him. Pray. When we sin, just confess. Be like, God, I know that's not where I'm supposed to be. That wasn't what you wanted. Please forgive me. Let's move on. Let's try again. Oh, this, this thing is dead ending? Great. Fail fast. Drop it. Move on. See where God is actually calling you to be. And the sooner we get into that spot, the sooner you start to see, this is what God's been preparing me for. This is what he had in store. So my prayer and my dream is the same as Moses' dream, that every single one of us here would just be lit up and illuminated, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Um, not just when you want it, not just when you're ready for it, but just whenever and always so that we could see people running around speaking on behalf of God, running around doing miracles, running around speaking words of hope and life. And then you really don't need like evangelistic campaigns anymore at that point, do you? You don't need like church marketing. If all the Christians are running around on fire for the Lord and praising God, you don't need help. You just need people to look at you like, what the? And then you say, why? And that's all Holy Spirit stuff. That's all, everything we talk about today is the Holy Spirit's error. So if you're missing any of these components, you probably have like a power deficiency. Got like an iron deficiency, spiritually speaking. You're just running low on power and that's all Holy Spirit. So may your prayers be for the Holy Spirit and you to connect. May your actions be, okay, Holy Spirit, I'm about to do this. Please lead me. May your, your decisions be, Holy Spirit, direct me. I'm out of crossroads. May your, your witnessing be, Holy Spirit, how do you want me to help this person? Uh, sending off our graduates, Holy Spirit, please go with them because I'm not. We're cutting the cord. <laughs> Plug them into God so that they'll be fine. They'll be better than we ever were. It's got to be all Holy Spirit stuff. Um, and Francis Chan has a book that he wrote called Forgotten God, which is talking about the role of the Holy Spirit in the church. And if you haven't read that or gone through a workshop on it, I encourage you to just think about the fact that you might be really good at believing in God and you might know a lot about Jesus, but maybe you haven't taken enough time to think about the connection you have with the Holy Spirit. But if you haven't, you're missing the best part of all of it because Jesus said, it's better for you if I go. What could be better than Jesus right here? Better is the Holy Spirit. More deeper, wider, further, brighter, right? That's Holy Spirit terminology. 
And that's my dream for us. And uh, before we think that transplanting our church to Taunton to a storefront place will be like, oh, if I can only become a missionary full time on a foreign field. When we get to Taunton, we'll know how to speak for the Lord and live for him. When we get to Taunton, then I'll know how to witness to my friends. When we get to Taunton, then I'll see the Holy Spirit give me gifts and talents and skills. It's not about Taunton. It's about you. And it's about the Holy Spirit. And then it doesn't actually matter where you are. It doesn't matter because God's everywhere. So my dream is that we'll see this now. We'll see this summer, this fall, we'll feel the Holy Spirit becoming more a part of our faith than ever before. And that will give us the hope that, oh, God's preparing us so when we do get transplanted someplace else, we'll know what that looks like. We'll know what that feels like. And be all more of the same, more and better of the same and good. So that's my prayer and my dream. Um, Devin, why don't we head into a time of prayer, reflection, taking communion together. But I'd just like to say a prayer for us, for this, before we, we transition. So please pray with me. Father, it's your spirit that we want, not ours. Please help us to recognize the difference between our own voice in our head and your beautiful whispers in our minds. Pray for discernment between spirits. Pray for truth to show what is really from you and what's not and what we need and what we don't. Holy Spirit, we're sorry for the times that we've grieved you. We're sorry for the times we've resisted you. Apologize for the times that we have quenched you, quenched you in our lives. Apologize for the times that we have attempted to lie to you as if we could convince you or hide from you. Apologize for the times that we've taken your name in vain instead of living by your power. So please forgive us for our sins against you, Spirit, as you dwell within us. May we be clean slates this morning. May we be open and receptive and do some filling, Holy Spirit. May we not just be baptized into the name of Jesus. May we baptize into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And may we be filled again and again and again. And may you increase our capacity and then us be filled more. And then may you expand us and may we be filled more and greater. All for God's glory, not ours. Spirit, may you give God glory through us. May you shine through us despite us. Please extend your grace and mercy to us, and especially for those whom we are sending out into the world this Sunday, wherever they may go. Please go with them, go before them, be called alongside of them. We call you, Holy Spirit, alongside them. Please be their counselor, their advocate, their helper, their comforter in every possible way at all times, even when they don't know they need it. We pray that for ourselves as well. Please be with us at all times and in all ways. Spirit, unify us and give us the Father's love. And um, may we see you along the way at the places that you're, you're waiting for us to show up at. May give us feet to walk to those spots and, and faith to, to step into the big moments knowing that you've called us there um, for your plans. So for each one here, Father, I ask for your blessing and your forgiveness and your empowering for a personal connection to grow between each of us and you, something that no one can touch. It's just life-changing for each one. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.